Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a returning good brother to the temple, coming to us from the Homebrew Network and the and the. The madman behind the myth behind the Mythcraft role-playing game. Now return now returning with its first expansion in the form of Veil of the Eternal Night. Which given all of the art that's that's been showcased for the game for the game. Oh, it's very clear what its inspirations are. <laughs> the, <laughs> the one and only Nathan H. <laughs> hey Miltra, thanks for uh, having me back to the temple. Excited to be here again. Yeah, thank you for coming back, and I would I would say braving the hell of time zones, but you and I are in the same time zone. Yep, for once the stars uh, aligned in our favor. Mm -hmm. But you you know how it is. Everybody forgets that Central Time exists. They think that it's either Eastern or Pacific. Right. Which makes me f feel bad for. I'd say I feel bad for all those Mountain Time time people, but I've had to deal with so many mile-high weed jokes over the le over the last decade that I have no sympathy. Oh. No, the people who I really feel sorry for are the people who are who are up in parts of Canada, Canada like St. John's Island, where there's an extra 15 minutes onto the time zone difference. Oh, I hate that. I didn't know that was a thing. That's yeah, th there's like two or three different time zones in, par in parts of Canada that have uh, um, extra fifteen or forty-five minutes, and I have no idea why. Yeah, it's like just you. I'm sitting there going, "Keep it simple, stupid. Use the hours like everybody else." Right. Uh, no, some people get some people got to be special. <laughs> like Arizona doesn't do daylight savings. That throws it off too. Yeah, I think I think the Arizona heat has gotten to their brain. Right. Makes sense. I mean, I so I'm certainly not gonna do certainly not gonna go into go into that kind of heat. I don't feel like um I don't if I wanted to return to Mordor, I just watch Lord of the Rings. Right. But see from the safety of your living room. Yeah. Also, also, I can always I can always laugh at at some of those people whenever they get to a a little bit of cold. You know, the, you know, some sixty degrees in the park has come out. Sixty degrees. I was in Georgia when that st when that storm hit a few years ago, and I was dying of laughter seeing everybody <laughs> seeing everybody um, pa panic over one inch of snow. Yep. You know how it is. You could be up to your neck, and the schools would be like, "No, we're not closing." But. Now, with Veil of Eternal Night, since the last time I had you on was for Mythcraft proper, so I suppose I'll op I suppose I'll open was was this particular setting, which is going to be for both Mythcraft and for Five E. Was this something that you guys had in, had in the back burner while Mythcraft was being developed, or did the idea for this come after the fact? Uh, the idea came. Uh... While we were in uh, probably phase three of uh, playtesting, so we had most of the classes like fully locked in. We were tinkering with some monsters uh, and uh, figuring out what all to put into the Mythcrafter's Guide um, when we started thinking about this. Mm -hmm. um, that would have been early fall, mid-fall of uh, 2023. Uh, the uh, setting itself is still in the same uh, like world as uh, the Mythcraft like, official setting. Mm -hmm. um, it is a few uh, thousand miles north of the uh, current campaign module that I'm writing that's coming out over the next four to six months. Yep. And with the, now with that in mind, I do I remember when this was first hinted at on the Discord, and there was. There was there was a bit of there was a bit of character art that was showcased, but the big thing was it's it was drawing upon Castle I believe Castlevania is obviously the biggest um, 
point of For influence, sure. but I also recall Berserk being brought up. And yeah. was it a, was it a case where you were you and the other guys were just wa- were watching either um, Netflix Castlevania or something else, and the idea came about, or was this something you guys had wanted to do for a while? Uh, a mix of the two, actually. So I I mapped out a whole bunch of uh, different campaign modules that I would want to develop at some point. Um, I did that maybe late summer while I was uh, working on the Mythcrafter's Guide and figuring out the timeline of the lore for Mythcraft. Um, it was around that same time that Castlevania Nocturne came out. Um, and so uh, we all got really excited over that. Um, I love the Castlevania anime. I actually watched it before I played any of the games, um, and now I'm going back and playing through the games as well. Uh, but seeing Castlevania Nocturne got the gears turning. Like There was a lot of hype around that, and we thought this, this would be a great... Um, something Castlevania-inspired would be a great Mythcraft campaign. Um, and uh, so I looked at the uh, lore that I was working on. I looked at the campaign modules that I had just outlined. Um, and when I say outline, I don't mean like a detailed, uh, like level by level, this is uh, kind of what the module looks like. I just mean this is the concept of the module. We've got a Dracula esque campaign module slotted in at such and such time period. Um, and so we took that idea and took like inspiration from Castlevania and then started expanding from there, looking for other uh, vampiric inspiration, other gothic horror inspiration. So like uh, Mm -hmm. Frankenstein, um, video games like Darkest Dungeon, like those kinds of inspirations, Mm -hmm. those all started feeding into this project. Is it Frankenstein or Frankenstein? I have only ever said Frankenstein, but it it could be Frankenstein. They're, uh, what, Swiss? I believe she's Swiss. Yeah, I, I had to make the young Frankenstein joke. <laughs> you know, the whole the whole time he keeps insisting his name is Frankenstein. Uh huh. Is it Frederick Frankenstein? <laughs> but I can I can definitely I can definitely get that get that particular um, vibe. Now. I will admit part of the reason I want I wanted to ask on that is because I remember the last time I had you on you had mentioned that the homebrew network for the longest time was doing 5e stuff exclusively then the incident last year happened and that led to a cha- that led to a chain reaction that led to the creation of uh, Mythcraft I'm obviously summarizing the story from last time but that's yeah, a big that's a big part of it. Yeah. So, with that with that in with that in mind, when it came when it came to the, when it came to this, um, one of the you guys are doing three you guys are doing this as a three book trilogy, as in a right. sense. Um, I'd like to. And I'd like to go through each of the, each of the three books and get kind of a feel for what for what's going to happen. The first, um, Harker's Guide to Vampire Hunting, which I'm guessing is the player facing end of this trilogy. Yes. Um, yeah. Quickly before I get to Harker's, I want to touch on the uh, the two uh, game systems. I'm obviously not a huge fan of uh, Wizards of the Coast in its current iteration because of decisions that they've made that I think are not very good for the gaming community. Um, mm-hmm. But of course, I still enjoy 5th edition, and it's easy to pick up and play. Um, it is Its character creation system is a bit more streamlined than Mythcraft. I mean, that's one of Mythcraft's selling factors, right, is the customization. Um, and so... Kind of with that in mind, we wanted to cater to both crowds and perhaps offer a bridge where, like, 5th edition players can play Veil of the Eternal Night in their the system they're used to, and then perhaps try it in Mythcraft as well, and kind of see how the two styles work. Um, that said, yeah, Harker's Guide to Vampire Hunting, and this is going to be the case for each of the each of the books in the trilogy. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you when you buy a book, you'll pick either. Mythcraft or D&D. We don't have both Mythcraft and D&D in each book. Um, but 
Parker's Guide to uh, Vampire Hunting has all of the different lineages, backgrounds, professions, classes, magic, and uh, artifacts that we have ideated and that we're unlocking over the course of the Kickstarter campaign. Um, it will also have an appendix of uh, um, generic, like, I mean, basically, uh, basically like a Volo's Guide to Monsters or a, what's the newer one? Um, Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft. Kind of an appendix of uh, monsters that you can, the Mythcrafter or the Dungeon Master could add to their uh, bestiary. Yeah. And with that, going f going further in going further into that, the next two the next two would be Daughter of the Shadows and Soliloquy of Annihilation. Yes, uh, in the other order, so Lelequy mm -hmm. of Annihilation comes first, mm -hmm. um, and these are a uh, these are the campaign modules. The first mm -hmm. one takes you halfway to maximum level. The second one takes you all the way to maximum level. In mm -hmm. D and D fifth edition, that's obviously level twenty. In Mythcraft, that's level thirty. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, uh, so Lelequy of Annihilation sends the heroes on a journey through this region of Ansara. The official Mythcraft world mm -hmm. uh, that Dracula is in the process of conquering, and they're trying to unveil secrets to figure out how to take down Dracula. They're trying to make alliances with other NPCs to help them uh, help hedge in Dracula and keep him from uh, his his aggression, his um, annexation of the region, mm -hmm. and eventually confronting him directly. And then... Uh, Daughter of the Shadows is kind of the fallout from that confrontation with Dracula. It follows a uh, character named Palorva, who is Dracula's daughter in this iteration of Dracula. Um, and uh, her skill as a um, political schemer and uh, um, political like alliance making ends up making her even more of a threat than Dracula himself was. Mm-hmm. I can, I can, I can certainly get that. Now, going in, going into the nitty nitty gritty of things, um, since this is going to be dealing with a, a fair few a fair few player options, um, and I'd I'd like to, and I'm going to be skewing towards the Mythcraft end, end of things for that for this. I do want to know okay. that. Um, okay. One of the bit one of the big pillars of Mythcraft's character creation is. What you've, what you've nick, what you've nicknamed bops or background, occupation, and profession. Now, yeah. it does talk. It does talk about certain, certain ra certain races like Gretchling, Dampier, Bat Batfolk. Um, for the for the Mythcraft end, end of things, with when it comes to the setting, are lineage are there are there going to be additional lineages, backgrounds, and professions? In all, in all three, or is it going to focus my, mainly on lineage? I'm sorry, in uh, in the fifth edition book. No, in in the in um in the Mythcraft book book for Vale, is it is are all three parts of Bob getting expanded or primarily lineages? Oh, sure. Um, we we have fully ideated our lineages. Um, we're uh, we are going to bring in some new uh, backgrounds and some new professions. Um, I'm sorry, at at least some new professions. Mm -hmm. We have ideas for a couple new backgrounds, but those are a lot. Um, those are a lot more generic. In Mythcraft, the nine like core backgrounds cover a lot of ground. Um, so there there are a couple new background ideas that we're tinkering with, but at least you'll see new professions such as. Bartender or Silversmith, I believe, are the two that we're um, using right now. Mm -hmm. And when it came to when it came to the lineages in Mythcraft, there were there were a handful of um, of, of variants, um, sub lineages, as it were. Is that is that something that's being considered, or is it not likely that there's going to be sub lineages for these entries? Um, I think we're going to see a mix there. The uh, Bat Folk 
is uh, probably going to be pretty straightforward. I mean, if you look at the uh, um, Kedek and the Hondu, which respectively are cat people and dog people in mm -hmm. Mythcraft, they have a fair amount of customization, but they don't have uh, like sub lineages. I think the same is likely going to be true of uh, Bad Folk. Um, the uh, there's another lineage that we're working on that is basically what if um, I I can spoil. No, it, it's a very minor spoiler. So in a, there there's a character in a, the Castlevania anime that is a night creature that gains sentience. Mm -hmm. Um and we are we're working on a, a lineage to that effect. That one is more likely to have sub lineages because of the vast like array of uh, creatures summoned up from hell that you might see. Mhm. Mm so continuing on, now continuing on from that. It's since it sounds like while the while all three parts of Bop are going to get some expansion, uh, lineages are getting the lion's share of it, as it were. I, I, I think that I would say between lineages and professions, I would say each of those are getting um, a fair amount of expansion. Mm -hmm. Lineages we have more ideated right now. I can talk a little bit more about concepts there because yeah. we've we've spent more time brainstorming it. But we mm -hmm. we do have plans for a robust um, rollout of professions. Yeah. Now when it now when it comes to class when it comes to um, subclasses in Five E, obviously Mythcraft doesn't have doesn't have that per se. It has the um, ta it has the stacks essentially. Mm -hmm. And I'm get I'm guessing that the new, that some of the new subclasses, or at least subclasses for the five E version, like Plague Doctor, like the Branded, like the Descendant that you guys have, that it that is going to have its equivalent in a tr in a um, track for Mythcraft. Yes, that's correct. Mm -hmm. So I believe the in in Mythcraft you, instead of the Plague Doctor, you have the Tinkerer. As a um, as a stack, uh, not quite. The plague doctor in Mythcraft is a uh, a class track for the Tinkerer. The Tinkerer is the class. Plague mm -hmm. doctor is one of the tracks. Ah, and now ob obviously the, there's going there's going to be there's going to be thirteen stacks. So what I'd like to what I'd like to delve into a little bit is some is some of the highlights of a few of them because obviously going through all thirteen and that's not even getting into any um, ones unlocked through stretch goals that would be quite the endeavor. <laughs> so I'll start I'll start with the plague doctor. What is that What is that particularly bringing to the table if someone wants to go down that path? Yeah, uh, primarily, it, Plague Doctor is a strong um, support archetype. It is uh, really good at buffing and uh, debuffing, depending on how you build it. Um, obviously, it's good at treating diseases. We're working on uh, adding more robust like disease rules to uh, both game systems for this uh, setting, so that the Plague Doctor can really shine there. Um, it can treat diseases. If you're if you're more of a malicious doctor, you can inflict diseases on your enemies. Um, you can, uh, you know, I, I'm thinking about the different archetypal tools that a plague doctor has at their disposal. So they have their beak mask, obviously, which has herbs and stuff in it to keep out maladies. Um, so you. Uh, as a plague doctor, you get more and more resistant to diseases, to poison, to things of that nature. Uh, you've got your thurible to release like good-smelling uh, incense that theoretically would keep disease away. Mm -hmm. The way I've built that out in uh, uh, Mythcraft is it is kind of like a like the zealot in Mythcraft is big on auras. The Tinkerer in Mythcraft is not, but this gives them a little bit of a way to play with auras. They can make their allies, like, rallied or focused, which are different positive conditions that give them bonuses, um, while they're within 5 or 10 feet of the Plague Doctor's Thurible aroma. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, You've got a scalpel to do surgeries, or to, if you want to go kind of the rogue multi-class idea, and you want to focus on, like, a stabby object, then the scalpel is perfect. Um, And then the big one that I think, uh, especially for people who play Darkest Dungeon and are familiar with the Plague Doctor archetype there, I think this one will really appeal to them. You can either go into alchemy or into medicine, and you can make uh, antigens or pathogens, again, just to help uh, injure people against diseases or inflict diseases upon people. Mm-hmm. The pharmacist and the harmacist. And <laughs> I will admit the I will admit the scalpel um, setup that you mentioned, for whatever reason, it reminds me of Repo the Genetic Opera. I'm I'm not familiar with that. It's a I won't say it's a I won't say it's a long story, but basically you have you have a surgeon as a repo man because you can because in that world um getting cert getting surgery for organs and the like can be done on payment plans. But if you don't pay up, they're, then they're going to send a repo man to take their stuff back. Yeah. Yeah. Looking at some uh, images of it, I can see see the connection. Mm-hmm. And um, your compliance is not a factor if they if they feel they need <laughs> to take their stuff back, right? Because they're get they're getting it back, and if if it means that you're not getting back up afterwards, that's not their problem. But. The branded is the next one I wanted to ask about, especially since just by the name alone, that's go- that's going to ca- that's going to carry the um imp- the berserk implications the most. Mm-hmm. It doesn't exactly help that you have somebody with a very large sword in the t- representative art for it, <laughs> right? Uh, so yeah, yeah. with so with the branded, which I believe is meant to be a track for the berserker. Correct. Mm-hmm. Uh, how is how is that going to be working out? Yeah, so that one is actually one that uh, Grant has been ideating the most. So I'll uh, um, I'll offer my ideas on it, but I think that uh, he's he's planning on taking point drafting that. So I'm not sure exactly the direction he's going with it. Mm-hmm. Um, just based on the uh, inspiration, I believe the uh, the brand uh, is what gives you uh, like your source of of demonic power, right? And so you're able to channel that into your weapon attacks, into your physical stamina. So there will probably be some kind of mechanic where you've got like a pool of uh, um, almost like a magic item, like charges per mm-hmm. day that you can use to deal more damage or to restore health to you. Um, uh, I imagine, especially when you're bloodied, that becomes more effective um, as you're going into your like kind of fight or flight battle focus instinct. Um, yeah, those are kind of the basic ideas behind it. Hmm. Now, with the now, of course, the next one on the on my list is the is the Descendant, which I believe is going to be a track for Warrior. Are you taking point on that one? Um, I, I've, I've built out my team of writers, so I'm not actually going to be the one drafting it specifically, but this one is more my like design ideation. So yeah, I can talk about this one more. Um, the mm-hmm. uh, Descendant is uh, probably our most direct aside from like some of the art artistic choices it's one of our most direct uh homages to castlevania it's a uh, fighter or warrior who has uh, descended from a long line of uh, vampire hunters or vampire fighters and they've developed special weaponry to uh, counteract the vampire's most common abilities so this might include a crucifix boomerang or uh, notably a whip or like a um, a chain or whip fighting style um, in order to uh, keep the vampire at um you know an arm's length or significantly more than an arm's length um they'll also i'm sure be good at tracking vampires be good at dungeoneering some of those basic like survival instinct abilities that you're going to need in order to delve into a 
uh, vampires like Castle or Crypt. Mm -hmm. uh, and I know, I know that the uh, I know that the art has the whip because, of course, we of course we gotta have the whip. Um, yeah, but I don't think I don't think that your ha that you have it in the design that you're required to use a wh a um whip just be just due to how mythcraft is designed when it comes to equipment or yeah, is the yeah certainly not required it'd mm -hmm. just be like the uh i mean to compare it to a 5e subclass the the way that the uh, um fighter battle master works where you get to pick those um what are they called combat maneuvers uh the uh Descendant might have a menu kind of like that, where many of them focus on whip fighting specifically, but then you'd have another section of them that don't focus on whip fighting. Mm -hmm. I can, I can get, I can get that, and <laughs> I think it, I think it'd be there's there's, cer there's certainly certain. Um, certain weapons for the Castlevania series that have been passed down that could fill the role just as much, like, say, um, the Lacard Spear back in Bloodlines. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, or, and, hell, let's, let's not forget that the original whip was made, was made using alchemy. But, the... Now the the now uh, one that you guys are stating as exclusive to Mythcraft is the Hellcrafter, which yeah yeah I, I I imagine you can guess the inspiration for that one as well yeah very very much very much the the Devil Forge Masters in Castlevania whether that be Isaac whether that be Hector um. I suppose, I suppose if I wanted to cheat and bring in things that aren't um aren't in, aren't in Castlevania I could also invoke the um the le the um legionators in Chaos Legion. Mm, yeah. Yeah, so I mean the obvious like direct inspiration is as you said the the Devil Forge Master. So mm -hmm. there'll be different tracks with this new class that allow you to uh, bind uh, uh, spirits from hell into corpses. Like, uh, it's that same kind of concept. Um, and uh, depending on how you build your character, you might be able to summon large numbers of weak monsters or focus mm -hmm. on bringing up one very powerful monster to serve as your, like, champion specifically. Um, we're expanding it a little bit from the, like, traditional Devil Forge Master. Um, Hellcrafter does have slightly different lore implications. So aside from just pulling up like demons or lost souls, you can also pull up fire and brimstone. Uh, so this can, uh, if um, listeners are familiar with the Zealot uh, Consecrated Blade track of Mythcraft, where you have like, it, it's called blade. It doesn't have to be a sword. It could be, it doesn't even have to be a bladed weapon. It could be a hammer. Um, but you take a weapon and uh, increase its... You basically turn a mundane weapon into a magical weapon and slowly improve the capabilities of that weapon. Uh, this is kind of the inverse of that. It does the same thing, but instead of, like, radiant damage, you've got your fire and necrotic, like, you know, it's it's the, the brimstone side of it. Um, and then Hellcrafters are also going to be another occult casting class. So they're going to have access to a lot of different rituals. There will be ways for them to use those rituals to um, improve uh, all of the uh, minions that they've summoned up from hell. So so you pull a bunch of like bat creatures up from hell and then cast um, Cloven Step on them. And now they're bat creatures with goat legs and they can run around and have like extra kick attacks and things like that. So fun different combinations there. Yeah, I could, I could certainly see that, and I, I do recall, a, I do recall a few other archetypes, which I'm guess, I'm guessing the app, um, are still in the early development phase, being, being met, being mentioned, on the, on the Discord and elsewhere. In, fa in fact, in one case, 
um, the art for one of them was showcased. That being the um, Vampire Hunter, for instance. Oh, sure, yeah. Which is diff- obvious. The imagery of it gives me gives me the vibes of, say, Solomon Kane or um, Van Helsing from the movie, which I know a lot of people really don't like that movie. I find it to be a good bit of dumb fun, and the um, repeater crossbow in that thing has lived rent-free in my head for years. <laughs> Yeah, um, obviously some Van Helsing inspiration there. Uh, yeah, just your typical, I feel like Ranger is the obvious choice as a class pairing goes, but mm-hmm. it's a track that just gives you additional, like, very specific abilities that make you better at hunting vampires and other features of uh, the night. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'm get gu- I'm... I'm guessing that, I'm guessing that part of that is, ge- is gonna be them ha- them being able to being able to make specialized um, weaponry s- specifically for certain monsters, since that's all that's kind of the motif with with um, vampire hunters, you know, having particular equipment that's tailor made for that kind of thing. Whether exactly. it's these like, like you said, the, like... Uh, right, the repeating crossbow, mm-hmm. um, yeah, stakes, silvered weapons, garlic infused weapons things of that nature. Mm-hmm. And, hell, even with the Blade movies, I, I was always appreciative of, of the, way, the way equipment worked when it came to vampire hunting that, fo- that followed the rules of, um, vamp- of the vampires in that world. You know, na- namely, going into shock if you feed them garlic, so, you, so, so we have um, mace that has garlic in it. Um, right. Analogy to silver, and well, there's no shortage of what you can do with that. <laughs> um, yeah, and it's uh, Whistler, right? Is the name of the guy yeah. who makes a lot of the yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, UV UV rays, which which is one of those things that makes me go, why didn't anyone think of this so, um, sooner? I mean, <laughs> yeah, have, right. I mean, it's black lights. Black lights have been a thing for quite a while. I remember. Even if they got abused in in laser tags when I was a kid, <laughs> um, but there was also the whole the whole the more gruesome one was of course the introduction of EDTA. Uh, EDTA, I don't recall this. I ED- I've seen the whole Blade trilogy, but it's been a while since I've watched through all of them. EDTA is an anticoagulant. Um, it's okay. usually okay. used to try in universe it's described as being used to deal with blood clots. When it gets introduced to vampire blood, the blood cells start aggressively reproducing until uh, until the va- until the vampire in question um, explodes. Got it. Yes. Okay. I remember the visuals. I didn't remember the explanation of why. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Reminds me of when the uh, is it the morning star the or the dawn star the whip from. Uh, Castlevania. Morning it, Star. Like, it's a demon. Yeah, the Morning Star. It, it does the, the same kind of thing. Mm-hmm. At least visually, I'm sure. Lore wise, there's there's different stuff going on. Yeah. Uh, there was there was also the whole thing with the with those on cro- with those crosses in the tail end of the original cast um, Netflix Castlevania. You know that cer- that certain shapes just just mess with their head. Mm-hmm. Because because of their advanced sight, uh, you know it's. I think the appeal the appeal there is is it's treating vampire hunting as the same the same way that a professional hunter would hunt would hunt big game, you know, no, knowing the patterns, knowing um, the particular weaknesses and how to exploit them. Yeah, exactly. Hmm. Uh one of the other big, one of the other big ones was the that I remember being brought up was the oath of oath of the saints, um, which obviously the design of the design of it is with the with the crusader approach. For whatever reason, I was reminded of blasphemous looking at it. If you're if you're familiar with that particular, well, right now it's a duology. Oh. 
I'm not. It looks like it's a video game, though, right? Yeah. Yeah. A very similar art style. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Mm-hmm. I think I think it's mostly because of the the face on the hel- on the helm. Oh. Yeah. But with the what would the because I'm get I'm guessing that the oath of saints isn't or its equivalent is intended to be a track for the zealot. What yes. would that particularly add? Since we talked about the zealot largely being built around auras. Yeah. So uh, a couple things. This gives you kind of a way to uh, get some of those like warrior like in a in fifth edition the fighter is very focused on damage output in a mythcraft the warrior is um it has those options but it's more focused on battlefield control locking Mm -hmm. your enemies down um and so i think that while the zealot has a lot of auras it's very good at buffing its allies there's not as much in the way of like martial fighting right now for the zealot there's obviously the consecrated blade stack that i mentioned Mm -hmm. um and there's a couple fun options for the zealot there but this is more of that like front line damage absorption lock down the enemy so it can't get to the like squishier vampire hunter that's setting up the crossbow to launch a really big stake Mm -hmm. uh yeah more of that battlefield control and defensive play style Mm mm-hmm I wouldn't be surprised if some if somebody f- figured out a way to make a multi stake so that they could have have a way to introduce a shotgun into the setting without act without technically introducing a shotgun. <laughs> sure. Oh, uh, right. And I double barrel crossbow. I know. I know. I know that. Um. I, that. I that at one at one point I had imp- I had improvised what I co- what. Was this, was essentially a collection of of silver stakes, but because it was tied to an explosive, it was basically a medieval equivalent to a nail bomb. Nice. Uh, and of of course, in a more in a more modern ap- approach, um, most buildings have sprinklers, so just replace this, just consecrate the water that's in that's in <laughs> these sprinklers and start a fire. Yeah. <laughs> Now, now, all of a sudden, you've got a bunch of vampires dealing with the fact that they're being rained in holy water, a lit- a literal version of the hydro storm from from um, from from I believe I believe it was Rondo of Blood, um, but when it comes to the things, when it comes to the monsters, the things that go bump in the night. You talk. You talk about the Lycanthorps being tied to Ansera's Anse- moons, since Ansera has five moons. I'd like to go. F- I'd like to go a bit further into that. And how- is it a case where there are different forms of of lichen that are that are each tied to a particular moon in terms of when they transform, or how does it work? Yeah, uh, both when they transform and some of the characteristics that are associated with that moon mm-hmm. that affect the way the lycanthropic curse manifests itself. Um, I will see if I can pull up the names of the different moons real quick, because I don't remember them off the top of my head. But, um, for example, like in the free demo, there's the Dimunus werewolf, which is tied to... Uh, the moon Dimunus, which is the smallest and furthest away from Ansera. Uh, kind of like Pluto, right? It's just like a rock of ice. And so the Dimunus werewolf is your typical lycanthrope, but also has like cold-related abilities. Like its claws and its bite deal normal damage and deal a little bit of cold damage as well. Mm-hmm. Um, it's I can't remember if it resists cold or if it's straight up immune to cold, but like that's an example of how a moon can affect a werewolf in a setting where there are five different moons. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, here we go. The The other moons are uh, Primor, which is like a... Uh, um, I would... Uh, I'm going to make Star Wars references. I would compare it to like Tatooine or Geonosis or Mustafar. Like it's a, it's a hot planet. It's a volcanic planet. It's a desert planet. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of the opposite... Or moon, sorry, not planet opposite of Dimunus. Sylvan, which, given the name, obviously, that's like a forest moon. Um, And so, 
that's kind of your typical werewolf, but imagine that they also have access to, like, primal magic. You know, they're extra good at tracking. They might even be able to uh, summon other wolves, uh, or uh, their howl might cause plants to awaken and fight on their behalf, even, depending on um, how powerful the wolf is. Uh, hmm. Garvor is the largest of the five moons, and so werewolves related to that are just, you know, extra big. Uh, I think one of our writers called them Chad werewolves. They're just chunks. Um, and uh, the last one is Scarlin, which is a gas moon. And so these werewolves would be especially terrifying because there's a possibility that they could, like, phase through walls or things of that nature. Mm-hmm. I can, I can see how I can see how that could be that could be particularly nasty. Now, there's also there's also talk of a higher of a um, hierarchy of vampires. Now, obviously, vampires like the, like the Big D himself are going to be at the are going to be at the top of that. But is it a, is it a case where this hierarchy of vampires is is like the um, ranking tiers of noble titles? Within Dracula's domain, yes, I, I would say that's a fair way to think about it. Now, think about Game of Thrones and how messy that hierarchical system actually is in practice. And uh, you're likely to see some of that with the vampires as well. Like the Viscount vampires trying to um, screw over what's what's above a Viscount. Is it a duke or is it the other way around? I think it's a duke. Trying to screw over the duke so that they can claw their way into greater power. I, w I always looked at it very simply. There, the it's it's divided into two people, two types of people. Those you those you can stab in the back, and those that you stab in the front. Exactly. <laughs> that so, also so, might be the official um, way way, th way things work in Rome. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Right. Oh. So I'm sure the vampires are always looking for improving their own standing mm -hmm. gaining more of the slice of the proverbial pie yeah this is also known as klingon promotion tactics <laughs> right and because it's got to cling on to what you got yeah that was terrible <laughs> that was terrible and i hope you feel terrible but sorry to say, I don't. I enjoyed that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You can't shame someone who has no shame. Mm -hmm. But when it comes to legacy art artifacts, uh, this whole concept of uh, of artifacts that level with you, I don't. I I ended up double checking the Mythcrafter's Guide that it's not in. The, I know that it's not in there. When it comes. With this particular concept, I think the last time that I saw it in a significant form, which wasn't even the wasn't technically the same, was the artifact system that was in fourth edition, the edition I'm supposed to hate, but I don't because they don't pay me. Yeah, uh, I, I, I enjoyed fourth edition as well, but I can't recall. Um, I mean, I mainly played at conventions. I didn't do a lot of writing and. Uh, a lot of like deep dives on it. Uh, well, during this point. I can I can give you a skinny on how artifacts worked in that setup. Yeah. Okay. Oh, uh, it wasn't exactly leveling up with you. Artifacts were had their own. It had their own unique advancement setup, and if you did things that the artifact like, it would further progress along that track. If you did things the artifact didn't like, it would do the opposite. You know, it was go okay. it was going with the idea that the artifacts, even if they don't have a voice, although some of them do. Hi, everybody, part of Vecna. How you doing? <laughs> uh, <laughs> they would they would uh, they would develop they would develop further along as you as as you utilize them and did and did things that they approved of. Okay. And is in the when it comes to the legacy artifacts, is it a case where your overall level is going to determine what benefits that artifact has, or is it on its own track? 
Yeah, it uh, it's based on your overall level. So, in um, again, in the demo, there's an example with Blessed Wind, the Sword of the Skies. Uh, but with each of the different artifacts, they'll gain uh, new abilities in Mythcraft for every four character levels. So if you happen upon one at level one, you would get its next unlock at level five. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I had, I had to double, ch I had to double check. It's what I was refer, what I was referring to as far as that track. It was um, what's known as concordance. Which there were three okay. tiers of normal, satisfied, and pleased, as well okay. as and of course unsatisfied and angered, which is basically when the thing doesn't like you and it's like screw you, I'm picking somebody else. Yep. But given now, uh, given that given that whole leveling up with you. Is it go is it going to be a case where it's where it's going to the f it's going through the full range of levels or is there going to be some cutoff? Um, no, there there wouldn't be a cutoff with them, given that it's every four levels. Uh, in Mythcraft, if you get one as early as level three, that means you have the potential of unlocking eight different enhancements for mm -hmm. the item. And enhancements are kind of like talents in the same way that like a class has different uh, stacks or different tracks, and you can take talents from those tracks. Um, the uh, or if you think about like a, a level up tree in like a video game, um, you can uh, pick from different uh, types of enhancements. Like the example I used earlier was Blessed Wind. You can uh, focus on. Uh, your damage output with it, or you can focus on developing a uh, telepathic connection with it that allows you to uh, psychically move it around and have it fight at range. Mm -hmm. Now, with that, with that in mind, since you, since you mentioned that it's akin to a track, is it, it, it sounds like it's going to be a case where you have a short list of features that that artifact has. Right, yeah. I mean, they're not as robust as whole, like, class tracks. Again, at maximum level, you would be able to potentially unlock eight enhancements. Mm -hmm. So each track of enhancements for a legacy item, um, I believe caps at... Uh, there might there might be a couple exceptions where we have six um, in a single track, but most of them are four or five in a track. Yeah. Now, I real I realize this I realize this might be pushing it, but are there any artifacts you'd give as an exa as an example and what sort of benefits you could unlock with it just to put things in perspective? Uh yeah, I'll do one more besides uh Blessed Wind, which is the Sovereign's Orb. Mm -hmm. And uh that's like, you know, it's the what's the other the Latin name for it? Globus Cruciger. It's the ball with the little cross on it. It's the Holy Hand Grenade of Antioch. Mhm. Mm um and uh, the different tracks that you could get with that one, uh, one of them enhances your authority. Obviously, that's like the historical importance of the item. Uh, it shows that, um, I mean, in real world history, it's like the, the Pope bestowing it upon a king the same way they might a crown to show that the king will rule over the world in Christian fashion. Um, so in uh, Mythcraft, obviously, the lore is a little bit different, but the authority that it lends is the same. So it improves, like, your charisma. It improves some of your influence-based skills. Um, another track would uh, let you communicate with the, uh, um, the memories of the people who have held the orb before you. Mm -hmm. So you can have, like, a council of elders in your head. You can have the various kings and queens and religious leaders of the past that have wielded this item, giving you advice. Sometimes they'll argue with each other, right? So there's a little bit of a detriment there. Uh, it's a little bit unpredictable, but they're always trying to help you in some way. Um, the other two tracks are a little bit more combat-focused than because those are both rather like social or exploration or uncovering lore. Uh, so the other two are kind of like the Zealot Auras. It it gives you access to some of the Zealot Auras. So if you're a Zealot, you just get more Auras. And if you're not a Zealot, it's a cheap way to like 
multi-class without having to invest your talents in it. Um, and then uh, it just gives you some basic uh, vaguely Monty Python inspired attacks where you can blind your enemies or um, do like bursts of radiant damage to them. Mm-hmm. I can I can certainly get that and moving up moving on from that when it comes to when it comes to the boss fights that you have planned I think one of the, one of the things that I that I find interesting in in what you're proposing is doing multiple doing multiple phases with their own mechanics which is a very a very dark souls thing to do mm -hmm. and how are, how are you going about it to make sure that it, that it's not just um, writing the writing the same boss multiple times with di with different gimmickry? Um, like, sorry, can you rephrase rephrase that question? I'm not quite like sure. How, I, I how are you how how do you plan how do you plan on implementing the idea of fi of phases when it comes to bosses to maintain a degree of escalation? Um, I'll, I'll take a stab. Tell me if I'm, uh, if I'm missing the, the question, but like in, uh, um, the, uh, Morgana boss fight, that's one that is included in the demo. Uh, she is the mistress of a tarot. And so when you're fighting her, she has a tarot deck divided into its major arcanas and its minor arcanas. And on each of her turns, she reveals new minor arcanas that, um, affect her stats and on each of her turns, she may choose to uh, reveal um, major arcanas. Uh, she doesn't have to. She's required to cycle through the minor arcanas, but she can pick and choose with major arcanas. And uh, those affect her fighting style. Like, they might give her an extra attack, or they might cause her to regain health, or um, there's one where she even shapeshifts into a, uh, a worm, like mm -hmm. a W-Y-R-M. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, these, so, I mean, that's a, that's by itself a dynamic combat. Once she is bloodied, then she gets two major arcanas at a time. And so that's, that's the way to escalate. Um, it doesn't change the mechanics other than making her have multiple, like, moving parts at once. Uh, but that's an example of, like, an escalation there. Mm -hmm. I'd, uh, contrast that with... Dracula, his fight is not as well like mapped out yet. Um, like Morgana is, is ready to go; it's ready for playtesting. The Draculas might be uh, you fight him in his throne room, and then you fight him across a series of like hallways and uh, shifting staircases, something of that nature. Uh, and then you fight him in uh, his like personal bedchamber or something, like a a shift in a locale. Mm -hmm. that comes with different challenges um the obvious like the star wars prequels do that to great effect so i would take inspiration there from like the geonosis factory or the mustafar like battle of the heroes mm -hmm. um, for like uh an escalation of stage environments yeah and that, even even people who don't even like the prequels will begrudgingly um admit the the um Gl the glorious insanity that is the most of our duel of fates battle. Yes. And m more recently, I'm not sure if you saw it, but somebody recreated that whole battle using the and using mo and remodeling um, Anakin and Obi Wan to look more like they did in the Clone Wars series. That's awesome. No, I I wasn't aware of that. Yeah. It, appar apparently, it took it took them like two and a half years to do it because. It, it was largely a it was largely a one man job, mm -hmm. and I'm pretty sure a full team could could knock it out in six months. But <laughs> just one one largely one person one doing all of that project. is a level of insanity that I don't want to delve into. Yeah. Uh, but I'm one of the obviously one of the big things that that Five E introduced was. Um, legendary actions and la and layer actions when it came to boss tier monsters. When it comes to the when it comes to the la the layers being their own character for more for Morgana or some of the other bosses that you have planned in the book, 
is it go is it going to be a similar thing where the boss environment itself is is kind of its own character with its with its own mechanics for sure i think we'll we'll see that morgana is a good example because the her dungeon is based on a tarot spread that you do when the heroes first arrive mm -hmm. and that determines where and what are in different like rooms in the in the mansion mm -hmm. um you know dracula's castle i'm sure has all kinds of dangers cool. inside it yeah and i i and in a roundabout way this ends up carrying the castlevania uh, motif even even stronger than what people would expect because there's there's one line that was in symphony of the night that was used somewhat as a throwaway line that everyone kind of glossed over where he where Alucard called the castle a creature of chaos that can take many incarnations. Indeed, yeah. And that you could you could say that that's used to justify why the why the castle keeps looking different in each game that it shows up in. Mm -hmm. But the the implication I've always seen it is that the castle it's the castle itself is not a standard brick and mortar castle anymore. But essentially, I guess I guess I'd call it a castle-shaped demon. Right. It's got a will of its own, a mm -hmm. malignant will of its own. Mm-hmm. Uh, where obviously the castle in the in the anime that what that wasn't the case, which is which is why the whole thing could be tr could be trapped even if the even if it meant breaking its teleportation setup. Nice job, nice job breaking it, Cypher. Right, but it all it also means that in the, that you could re you could redo the more the Morgana boss fight with different players and get different um, setups, just to use that as an example. Plus, you are you already as as I understand it, you're already planning on doing a tarot deck as it was. Yes, yeah, we've got an artist who's done a lot of the tarot cards. Mm -hmm. They'll have the whole deck done, obviously, by the time we ship it out. But um, yeah, yeah, really incredible art there. And when it comes to the arcana of that deck, is it going to be the standard major and minor arcana that people are get, who are familiar with tarot are going to be used to? Or are there certain cards that are exclusive to it? Kind of like how the Taroka in um, Ravenloft has a few exclusive cards to it. Uh, there are going to be a few that are not very familiar. It's a standard 22-card uh, Major Arcana, mm -hmm. so we're not expanding, but we are reinterpreting some of the cards. Um, the, uh, let me see, I have my own tarot deck here. Let me look through the Major Arcanas real quick for an example. Mm -hmm. uh, Like, okay, so the Empress we're replacing with the Mother, for an example. Uh, the Hierophant, I believe we're replacing with the Justicar. Um, or, no, I'm sorry, uh, Justice we're replacing with the Justicar. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, what is it? Is the Tower, I believe, is one of the major. Um, yeah. Yeah, so that one in our game is... Uh, the house of god so mm -hmm. there there's a couple that are um not quite one-to-one -one translatable like they have slightly different meanings but um it is going to be a standard uh deck a 78 card deck so you can do your um like celtic cross readings or other standard spreads uh they should they should still work yeah when it comes to i'm guessing that within the core book there's going to be an aside of what cards what the what the new arcana would be the equivalent of in a standard deck if someone wants to use a standard deck instead um yeah we're with the arcana deck or with the tarot deck we're releasing like a little guidebook um a lot of tarot decks include those mm -hmm. and so we'll include a, a translation tab there I, I i can i can certainly get that there's there's a few archetypes within the, within this um got within this idea of gothic horror a action that i'd be curious how one might convert them the myth to the mythcraft setup especially with the veil of eternal night that i wanted i wanted to run by you and i can give i can give a skinny if you're not familiar just 
just these one these ideas would probably would probably crop up from players so it's an interesting thing to explore the fir the first one is if someone say wanted to implement something akin to the trick weapons that are seen in bloodborne um how would you propose them them doing that within mythcraft's sandbox bloodborne is a mythos i'm not very well acquainted with um that what that was the souls like that is still a play is still a playstation exclusive um that is the big th the big thing with the hunters and the hunter's weapon is that on one hand you have a firearm and on the other hand you have a trick weapon trick weapons are what are are a case where it's a usually a one-handed weapon that Ha has a alternate form with its own at with its own different animations and you can switch between them very easily okay uh, the bit the main one is the cl is the cleaver that's on the cover art it where the bet where the um blade can the blade can further extend okay uh, Uh, so es essentially, you have a, you have a weapon that is that can switch between two forms at will. So, so in uh, in Mythcraft, I uh, think it takes it usually takes one AP to switch a weapon out. Like my my initial thought to do that rules as written is you would just take, for example, a longsword and a glaive as your two main weapons. And then I can't recall off the top of my head if there is a talent that lets you like quick draw and switch them out more quickly. Mm -hmm. um, if there is, I would just do that. If there is not, that's not that hard to homebrew um, yeah. at like your personal table. Mm -hmm. um, but to do that in like a, a rules as written way, that's that's the approach I would take. It's just use two weapons, but flavor wise, they count as one weapon. Yeah, and just just so you have an idea of what I mean. Uh, the image that I'm sharing with you is the saw cleaver from Bloodborne. That's the first. That's one of the first weapons you can get. Okay, um, I see. Yeah. So, the thing is, the the um, you have the blade can it, blade can extend out, so you can so you can hit with the other end. Since both sides of it are are um, cutting. Right. I, okay. Okay. I see. Like it's on a on a hinge. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And the, one the big the big reason for that strategy is when I say when I say that you can switch it at any time, I mean in the middle of combo you can switch between modes. Nice. Okay. Uh oh. The and be, because of that there's a bunch of different combo possibilities with um trick weapons. But Moving on from that, are you are you familiar at all with Vampire Hunter D? Um, only nominally. I've I've heard the name floating around, but I don't know much about it now. That start that started out as a light novel series by by Kikuchi, and since you've been doing the since you you guys have been doing the um, watch parties, I'd say Vampire Hunter D Bloodless might be a good might be a good suggestion for the future. Okay. Yeah. But, but um, the one of the other big things about it is that the a lot of the art within the light novel series was done by Yoshitaka Amano, a, na a name that needs very little introduction. Right. Uh, but his whole thing is be is being a damp fear and and hunting vampires. But there's a there's a couple things to note with him one of them is obviously his sword which can just be a standard um great sword in this in this case but the other thing is his left hand there's a lot of things that the left hand does but it's a it is a it is a sentient parasite essentially that is on his hand in bloodlust one of the big things that it's able to do aside from aside from sniff certain people out is um eat magic okay 
Like when you when yeah. you get stuck in a binding spell, he the left hand ends up swallowing the spell. Nice. Um, yeah, I mean, from a, a player build standpoint, I think that the vessel has quite a lot of potential there. Mm -hmm. You know, in, ter in terms of be in terms of being that kind of anti mage. Yeah, absolutely. There's mm -hmm. um, a lot of a lot of ways to absorb magic, and uh, I mean, there's one where you uh, um, you can absorb a spell into yourself, and then you can save it and cast it later. Things like mm -hmm. that. Yeah, he do he doesn't he doesn't cast any magic on its own. It just sw just swallows it as if it's as if it's absorbed into some void. Oh. So continuing on from that, since we are we already mentioned blade, I'm cu I'm curious how somebody would handle would handle that within this system. This vampire hunter that uses a variety of weapons, almost like a walking arsenal. Right. So I mean, obviously, the lineage would would be uh, Dampier. That's mm -hmm. one of the ones that we unlocked for the Kickstarter. Uh, I'd probably go uh, um, Ranger. Again, mm -hmm. Vampire Hunter, right? I mean, a Dampier who is a Vampire Hunter is basically what Blade is. Um, and then I would go into the combat specialization talents just to improve the uh, specific things that you can do with each of your different weapons. Yeah. Because ev despite the name, he's he's using as much, gu as much guns as he is swords. Right. And silver stakes and all the rest of it. Mm-hmm. So I'm, gu I'm guessing you'd probably lean into some talents that would allow for weapon tinkering. Yeah, yeah, that, that would make sense too. Focus on um, Vampire Hunter, but take a little bit of a dip into the tinkerer class. Mm -hmm. But the, b the big weakness that Blade has always had to deal with is the issue of the thirst. Um, and uh, there's whole subplots that... Um, focused around him trying to suppress it. Mm -hmm. In fact, in fact, that was one of the big subplots in the first movie that his body was developing a tolerance to the serum that was used to suppress it. Right. He got his like giant power up when he finally fed on his partner. Mm -hmm. With the damp fear in Veil of the Eternal Night, do they do they have to contend with the thirst as a drawback to their features, or do they have something? Um, similar, or at least there, in the yeah, same there will thing. be some kind of similar mechanic where they have to manage their their need to consume blood. Mm -hmm. That that certainly makes sense. So with I know you I know it's cur I know a lot of it is currently in the testing phase, but what would what would you be shooting for as far as a release window for the? Um, for at least the digital version of the trilogy. I know that the physical version, that's going to take a lot longer because printing and shipping and all of that fun stuff. Right. Uh, digital version, like, fully playtested and ready for public consumption. Um, I think that we could expect it in November. Um, mm -hmm. If things go really well, we might be able to move it up. It would be fun to release it before Halloween. Mm -hmm. Um so, I mean, that would be my ambitious goal, is get the digital stuff out to people by Halloween. But certainly November, I think, is, is a safe bet. Um, for playtesting, we're probably looking at late spring. Mm-hmm. Which will be a good will be a good way to, to get pe to get people in get people in the tables and <laughs> and um oh and Away from the seasonal whiplash when th when things warm up. Uh, of course, depend. Of course, that all depends on whether or not a certain groundhog sees his shadow or not. Has the groundhog not emerged yet? I thought that was yesterday. I guess we're I had, still waiting. I had I hadn't checked on what on whether whether Puxatawney Phil has had his message translated or not. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but. At the, but I will certainly look forward to seeing how to seeing how it develops, especially since the so, that was another thing I wanted to get into the. How did how did you guys ended up landing 
the this whole thing of working with Jeffrey Day, the get the guy who's been at the forefront of this Argent Metal subgenre that's come off of Doom. Yeah, how did we manage that? I don't know. Rant's, <laughs> Rant's magic. <laughs> we um we are thrilled to get to partner with him. His music is is wonderful. Um, mm-hmm. his video game covers, uh, among all of his other like work, um. Yeah, mm-hmm. Taste of Death, the lyrical song that he put together for this is just amazing. Mm-hmm. In fact, that was how some of my colleagues found out found out about the project, even though I had known about this for a while. Yeah, it was through uh, Jeffrey Day's name being attached to it. Yeah, because they're they're familiar with him, but th- but um, I was able to I was able to use that to peer pressure them into looking further into MythCraft. <laughs> well, thank you. That's awesome. Because that's what that's what I do in the temple. But with that said, I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens here. Yeah, thank you, Miltra. Mm-hmm. Pleasure as always. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Excellent. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay... Fucking frosty, everybody!